blessing to you all. Please settle your minds and determine to listen to the Dhamma at this time. And please sit comfortably and practice establishing mindfulness in the present moment, making your mind firm and peaceful in samadhi, following the feeling of the in-breath and the out-breath. Use this as a way to establish mindful awareness in the present moment. When we establish mindfulness in this way, uh, we're able to listen to the Dhamma well, and that Dhamma, the, that, those teachings we listen to, can be of great benefit to us. May help us to develop a deeper understanding of the truth that the Buddha was pointing to in his teachings. From that we gain insight that can release us from suffering and dispel our doubts. We've come together today to recollect uh, the occasion with Sakaburanami when the full moon day in May when the Buddha was born and then later enlightened and later achieved, attained Parinibbana. This is a time I've come personally to visit you all, the Sangha and laity here at Buddha Bodhivana Monastery. Uh, where you have Ajahn Kalyano as the abbot and teacher here. We've come to listen to the Dhamma then today and to practice meditation, keep the precepts, and to do the ceremonial circumambulation of the Ubozada Hall here to show our respect and reverence for the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We take up offerings of flowers, incense and candles to show this reverence. But actually the Lord Buddha reminded us that he didn't uh, seek or delight in material offerings as a teacher. He said he was happiest when people made their offerings in the form of practicing the Dhamma in order to raise the level of their mind, their consciousness to end suffering. So we should consider that it is our good fortune to have met with the Buddhist teachings at this time in our lives. Even in a country like Australia, far away from India or Thailand, um, we have the opportunity to hear the teachings and practice in a place like this. And we can see many of you have taken up that rare opportunity. The, the hall is full tonight. This is something we can all appreciate and feel good about. The Lord Buddha said that the practice of Dhamma begins with learning to establish the mind in sati, mindful awareness. The Buddha himself finally reached enlightenment after many, many lifetimes of practicing. We say four asankhayas and a hundred thousand kalpas, so many eons, many World systems passed, arose and passed away before the Buddha finally became enlightened. When he was born in, in Lumpini, in, uh, on the border with Nepal and India, he performed one miracle already as a baby. Uh, where he walked seven steps and then uttered the words, that, I am supreme in this world. Uh, I am the conqueror, I am the chief. This will be my last life. This was an expression of the fact that the Lord Buddha's um, parami were full. His spiritual perfections had been completed and he was ready for enlightenment. When he reached uh, 29 years old, he left his, the lay life, went out to study and practice uh, meditation with the leading teachers of the day, uh, Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputra. And he studied with them, learning to develop the practice of samadhi, training his mind in concentration to, until he attained all of the eight rupa jhanas and arupa jhanas. So he attained very peaceful, refined states of consciousness, of samadhi. But the Lord Buddha could also see that this wasn't in itself leading to any insight that would uproot the ignorance that was the cause for more birth, old age, sickness and death and more suffering. 
So he left those teachers and went off to practice very strictly uh, on the, the mountain, Dongasiri, practicing ascetic practices in the manner that uh, religious seekers might in those days, fasting for long periods, holding the breath and controlling the breath and practicing very, very strictly, pushing himself until he was very weak and the body became very thin, it was so thin that you could see his backbone through his stomach and his stomach through his back. He displayed great patience and endurance practicing in this way. He even fell unconscious three times because he was so weakened by his efforts. And yet he still did not reach enlightenment. And he realized that this was also not the way that he was going to develop insight or wisdom. He had a vision of, during this time, of uh, the three-string lute being played, how there was one string that was very loose, slack. You twang it, you, you pluck it, and the sound vibrates in not a very melodious sound because it's too loose. Another string, too tight, too taut. You pluck it, and it gives a very unpleasant, sharp twang because it's so tight, also not a very good sound. Just the one string in the middle was tightened just right, perfectly neither too tight nor too slack, and gives off a melodious sound. He contemplated this comparing our practice of meditation and the seeking of wisdom and understanding in this way, that if we become too slack and indulgent, seeking sense, pleasures, well, that will block the arising of wisdom and insight. If we become too ascetic and push ourselves to the point where we experience a lot of pain and discomfort, well, similarly, that will also be an obstacle to insight arising. So he decided it was time to develop this practice along what we call the middle way. So he started to eat food again, relax a little bit from his previous asceticism. That meant that his five disciples, the five ascetics who had been practicing with him out of faith in his austerities and his great endurance, felt he must have gone the wrong way and they went off and left him. They went to practice in the deer park where he would later go and teach them. He was offered milk rice by the Lady Sujata, uh, 49 mouthfuls uh, on a gold tray. And having eaten his, the milk rice and regained his strength, then he was, felt ready that this is the time where he was going to really put all his effort into practicing for enlightenment now. And he made his aditana, his resolution, where he floated that gold tray on the Nilangela River and said, if I have the qualities, the Bharami, the accumulated virtues and perfections to become enlightened and suffering at this time, uh, to go against the stream of the world, well, may this, this, this golden tray f- go against the stream of the current and float upstream. And it did. So then he walked across the river to where the Bodhi tree was, and he set up his seat, and he saw that facing the east direction, the the direction that the sun rises, was the most suitable for him to, direction for him to face as he practiced. The seat they call the Vajira Asana, it means the the diamond seat, because the, the Dhamma that he was to become enlightened with, the truth is like a diamond, the effect on the mind is to purify the mind and make it like a diamond. And he made his determination uh, to sacrifice everything, including his life, for the practice to to develop the insight that would lead to the end of suffering that night. So once he started practicing, his first recollection was of when he had been seven years old, out in the fields with his father, the king, performing the plowing ceremony. And he wandered off and sat quietly under the rose apple tree to meditate, practicing anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Uh, So he practiced this and entered jhana, and the first knowledge that came to him as he uh, entered deep states of jhanic concentration was the recollection of past lives. 
he practicing in the first watch of the night, say that period between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m., he developed this skill to recollect past lives, to see that he had been born in many, many innumerable lives, and the happiness, the suffering he'd experienced in all the different lives he'd had, he could recollect that. In the second watch of the night, from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., he developed the yata kamaputanyana, the knowledge or insight into the arising and passing away of beings, meaning he could see all beings, their karma, the karmic causes and conditions that preceded them, or where they came from in their past lives, and what led them to be born into the situation that they experienced this life and that the karma that they were making this life, where it was leading to them when they die, where they would be reborn. But this knowledge, although of great use, was still not the insight into the, uh, the origin of suffering, the end of suffering. So he pers- pursued his practice in the third watch of the night, from 2 p.m. to 6 a.m., contemplating the paticca samubhada, the p- process of causal conditioning or dependent origination, contemplating this body, the feelings, the mind and the dhamma, to see the causal nature of, of, of suffering, how with ignorance or avijja as a condition this gives rise to karmic formations on and through <coughs> till the arising of um, feeling through sense contact with feeling arises craving, with craving as a condition Upadana or clinging and attachment arises. You could see the whole process of causal conditioning that gives rise to suffering. He understood that, penetrated that by the time that dawn arrived. So we know the life story of the Lord Buddha from the suttas. And we can understand how he practiced from the beginning uh, until the point where he did finally become enlightened. He became uh, a self-enlightened Buddha, Sama Sam Buddha. Now we can determine to make our own practice an offering to him out of gratitude uh, by putting effort into following in his footsteps to establish mindfulness and direct this quality of sati to the body and to the mind. As we sit here tonight, we might experience some aches and pains and discomfort, different feelings in the body or arising from the body. Um, But what we have to do is determine to establish our minds with mindfulness, with this quality of knowing, and make this quality of knowing strong so that we can see when the waitana, the feeling arises, and we can see it arises with the body as a condition, but it's not the same thing as the body. The body is one thing, the feeling is another, and the mind that knows is another again. We practice like this to develop this kind of clarity through the continuous presence of mindfulness. And we practice according to our limits. However much strength and effort we can put in, well, we, we do that according to our own uh, limits and abilities. We might have to deal with different experiences. Say when you practice meditation late into the night, you might experience drowsiness um, or other mood changes. We might have periods where we feel very uh, inspired and happy and then other mood swings come and we feel very unhappy or find it very difficult or boring. But all of these can become objects for awareness, for mindfulness, and we can contemplate them to see, well, these are just conditions of mind, different mental states arising and passing away. This is what the kind of insight we can develop as we practice sitting and walking through a long period of time. We come to see that this body is just the body, merely the body. And it's not a, it's not my body, it's not me or mine, myself. It's actually made up of its component parts, the different organs, the bones, the flesh and so on. These come from the four elements. Really this body is just a combination of earth, air, fire and water. It's not really a being or a person 
in the way that we normally regard ourselves. This insight comes um, and it helps us to see that all aspects of this body and mind, the body, feelings, the mind, and the Dhamma, the objects of mind, they all arise and cease. When we practice mindfulness continuously, we can see the impermanent nature of all these conditions, just arising and passing away. That's their true nature. As we develop this understanding, it leads us to start letting go of, of, of our attachments. So tonight, you can practice letting go of your concerns, say, about your family, your work, what you might have to do next week, and so on. Just set all of those other concerns aside. Let it all go and just learn to develop mindfulness for one night. Put your attention on the in-breath and the out-breath. And if you keep doing this over and over again, you might find that your mind gathers together and unifies in the um, in the development of samadhi. We start to experience some peace, some calm. You might feel a sense of the mind unifying together or gathering together at your forehead or the tip of your nose or at the chest. You might experience some rapture arising in different ways. Maybe your body feels very light or parts of the body seem to just disappear from your experience. Or you might feel like you're just floating in thin air. All of these different kinds of experiences come when the mind calms down in samadhi This is what we call pity and sukha, sense of rapture and happiness that comes through the continuous presence of mindfulness. At first it might lead us to doubt a little bit or panic because we're not familiar with these experiences. But just try and contemplate to see this is just the natural result of the mind becoming full, becomes full with the continuous presence of mindfulness And as it becomes peaceful and full and content within itself, (coughs) this gives rise to energy as well. With this energy and this interest, we can keep practicing and maybe going for a bit longer to overcome the, the different hindrances and obstacles. So please really determine your heart and your mind to do the practice, to keep putting forth effort into the meditation tonight. Try not to spend too much time talking or socializing. Just dedicate yourself to the development of mindfulness and try to get to the point where you can see that all your feelings and thoughts and moods are just impermanent experiences arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. What is impermanent is not really a self. Try to see that, see that we don't really own our feelings and our thoughts. These are just conditions of mind and they're without a a real self or a being or a person. Maybe this very night, if we dedicate ourselves to the practice, we might really develop some deep insight into the Dhamma. We might keep practicing to bring up mindfulness so that the mind starts to separate from its usual attachment to this body and to feelings. And this is really the shortcut or the direct way to success in the practice. Just keep bringing up mindfulness over and over again. The more sustained our mindfulness, mindfulness is, then the more clarity we'll have, the more understanding we'll develop, and we'll really see the Dhamma that the Buddha taught will understand exactly what dukkha is, what suffering is. You know, as the Buddha taught, suffering is separation from that which we like, or being unified with that which we don't like, or in short, not getting our wishes fulfilled. This is suffering, and we'll be able to see suffering as suffering in an objective way, an unbiased way. We will be able to see that in our life as a human being, as we've lived in the world thus far, so far, we've already experienced quite a lot of suffering. Now we can see that we should set ourselves to really develop ourselves so that we can understand the Dhamma and put an end or reduce our suffering little by little till we get to the point where one day we'll be truly be able to uproot all the causes for our dukkha, our suffering, completely 
experience samucheda bahana, the complete uprooting of, of, of dukkha, by seeing the lack of self in this body and this mind and all the things we have in this world. Really everything we have, our own person and the, our possessions, our wealth, other people, these are all impermanent things without an owner. So really dedicate all your efforts to developing this kind of insight. Uh, study the Dhamma, listen to the Dhamma, contemplate the Dhamma, practice bringing up mindfulness. As we keep practicing, this will little by little give rise to a sense of peace in the mind. And from this peace, we'll gain more clarity, more understanding. Really, all the different meditation techniques and methods that you might learn in different uh, meditation centers or monasteries or from different teachers, they're all going into this same direction. All these methods they teach us to practice Sila, restraint of body and mind, uh, body and speech, to develop samadhi, concentration through development of mindfulness, and then to learn to investigate, to see the truth, to develop insight into the true nature of things. So we must really try to practice in each posture as we go through the night, sitting or walking, If we're strong enough, we might be able to meditate all through the night without stopping. After this talk, we will um, take a break. We'll do a circumambulation of the, the hall and the big Buddha statue with candles and incense. This is part of the practice as well. We mindfully walk around the hall holding the candles and incense as an offering to the Buddha. And this is how we can practice. We can make all of our practice as an offering out of gratitude to the Buddha for all the teachings that he gave. So we have, um, we'll just say thank you to Tanajan for his teachings and words of encouragement tonight. As he just said, we'll continue the program with the circumambulation. So... We have some flowers and incense, I think, hopefully enough for everybody can bring out.